It is good to be with you again tonight. If you have any updates to our prayer concerns, anything that we need to remember in our bulletin, any changes or corrections, please let me know by using the contact information on the screen. If you are joining us by phone tonight, the church number is 608-224-0274, and I would love to hear from you. If you have anything that we need to be praying about, I would appreciate that contact. Please remember that we are continuing to have two worship services every Lord's Day morning to keep us under the 25% capacity in our building. I think the health department right now is limiting churches to 50% capacity, but with the size of our building, it just seems safer and more wise for us to limit that to 25%. So that's what we're shooting for. That gives us plenty of room to spread out, a lot of space to spread out safely. We also have the TV going with the live stream downstairs, but we have the Lord's Supper prepared beforehand. So please be sure to sign up for one of those two services on the Sign Up Genius account. If you have any need for help with that, please get in touch either with me or with Kenna. And either one of us would be glad to help you through that. But our plan is to continue our class online and on the phone every Wednesday, as we have been doing for the past several months. And then we'll continue online and on the phone and at the church building every Sunday morning, just as we also have been doing for a couple months now. Please let me know if you have any questions or concerns, and be sure to sign up online. That makes sure that we get enough communion prepared so we don't have to make a last-minute scramble for that. I might say more about this in the future. I might send out... Uh, some thoughts typed out in an email or maybe an article to forward along to you. But I know that that our services are, are shorter than they have been in the past. We've had to make some changes, and I know how tempting it must be to wonder whether it's worth it. To get ready and to drive across town and to be out and around and, and to do all of this for what we may be very tempted and I guess tempted to say only 30 to 40 minutes of worship. And I would just encourage you, if that's the way you're thinking, just to prayerfully reconsider that on a regular basis. And I would encourage you, if at all possible, to be with us every Sunday if you're able. I'm not talking if you're sick or vulnerable. Let me get back to that in just a second. But if you're able to be with us for worship on Sunday, I would encourage you to do that and then not just for the half an hour or 45 minutes that we're together, but also for the time between the services. That time of Christian fellowship is so, so valuable. God knew what he was doing when he put us in a group uh, as a local congregation, and he knows the value of the local church, and that's why there is no organization for the Lord's Church beyond the local congregation. We don't have an earthly headquarters. This is it. This is us as a Four Lakes congregation, and we desperately need each other. We need to be together. We need the encouragement. We need to see our Christian family, and we need correction sometimes, and we need to hear from our elders personally, and we need to be together. We need to sing together. We need to pray together. We need to partake of the Lord's Supper together. And again, if you're sick or if you're vulnerable, that's different. If, if it's due to age or a health concern, uh, I would encourage you to follow the advice of the health authorities and stay home. Don't risk that. But if you're well, I really hope I can see you this coming uh, Lord's Day. We need each other in the Lord's Church. So just wanted to say that as we get started uh, this evening. I've had a little bit of a weird day today, and I don't know why, but for some reason my eyes flew open at about 3 o'clock this morning. And I laid there for a little bit. I think I listened to the news at the top of the hour at 3 o'clock. And I'm like, all right, forget it. I'm getting up. <laughs> Let's just get this day over with. So I got, a, I got a lot of extra study done this morning. So it's been a weird day for me. But I got done early with my studies today and got to get out and around a little bit. So I thought I'd pass that on. Hopefully, hopefully I can stay awake through this class tonight. But it's been a little bit unusual. I know we haven't had a chance to share much of our good news with each other lately, but my good news for this week, I shared on Facebook a couple days ago, but that is I got to go do some kayaking this past Monday morning, and it was absolutely perfect out there. I needed that. I put in at Esther Park Beach on the southern shore of Lake Monona. It was a little bit windy, and I actually almost turned back. Uh, the front of the kayak when I left Esther Park Beach was going a little bit airborne, and was smacking each wave. And about 100 yards out, I thought, oh no, what have I done? I need to turn back. And if I could have been able to turn back safely, I probably would have done it. But I was a little scared to turn. 
and not be heading directly into the waves. So I will admit that I offered a a brief prayer to the master of ocean and earth and skies as I was out there uh, heading out from Esther Park Beach. But I, I kept pressing forward and I uh, kept on going, made it to the mouth of the Yahara River where it empties from Lake Monona going south toward the belt line. And I took the Yahara uh, from Lake Monona down to the belt line and under the belt line, which is really cool to see what the belt line is like underneath. And then took it around what they call Gilligan's Island. So it's kind of known, I guess, as a party island on the weekends. Let me tell you, Monday morning, it was not a party island. I was the only one there. Uh, family of ducks. And that's what the picture is on the bottom there. The uh, the ducks going around Gilligan's, uh, <laughs> Gilligan's Island. Um, but anyway, took about three hours total round trip. I turned around down there. By the time I got back to Lake Monona, the wind had died down. And it was perfectly calm and so the picture on the top of the screen there if you can see that is when I got back to Lake Monona so a huge difference in only an hour and a half or so so the picture on top is of the Madison skyline on the way back the picture on the bottom is of the uh, ducks down there at Gilligan's Island uh, the next picture here on the top is heading south on the Yohara River just south of Lake Monona a lot of uh, just beautiful scenery there and then on the bottom is the kayak as I pulled over at Pontac Park in Monona to catch my breath on the way back before heading out into the uh, open water on Lake Monona. But anyway, that's my good news for the week, just briefly. I uh, had an enjoyable three hours of kayaking this past Monday morning, and again, it was interesting to see underneath the Beltline as it crosses over the Yahara River. Tonight, we're back to our study of the Book of Luke. In our class, I'm referring to the good resource that I pointed out over and over again, but A Harmony of the Gospels by Robert Thomas and Stanley Gundry. And really, thinking more about that, it's not really a book about the Bible as much as it is the actual Bible. It's, it's just Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the text of the Scripture, arranged in a different way than we might be accustomed to. So it's, it's basically the four Gospel accounts arranged in columns next to each other. So it's just a tool to help us understand the life of Jesus in chronological order. It's on Amazon for about 25 bucks. If you don't have that yet, let me know if I can help you get that. But it's just a, a tool that we're using. By way of review, we know Luke is a Gentile. He's a medical doctor. The beloved physician is the way Paul refers to him. He writes both Luke and Acts to a man by the name of Theophilus, who is perhaps a potential convert, a young Christian, maybe a wealthy sponsor. Uh, he makes a point of writing in chronological order. It is a well-researched account, as we would expect a physician to do. And Luke makes a point of including a number of people and groups that are often overlooked in the ancient world and sometimes oppressed. Women and Gentiles and Samaritans, as well as a variety of those who are sick. Last week, we looked at the parable of the Good Samaritan. We had the incident where Mary and Martha were there, and Mary was listening to Jesus. Martha was working, busy with the preparations, maybe the meal, and she wanted Jesus to correct Mary for not helping with the meal prep. And so we had that little incident, and Jesus took care of it very quickly. We had the disciples asking Jesus to teach them how to pray, uh, followed by the Lord giving something of a sample prayer. And then we had a few short parables before we ended our class uh, last Wednesday evening. So tonight we pick up with Luke eleven fourteen. Luke chapter 11, verse 14, and we hope to make it through the end of Luke chapter 11 over the next 45 minutes or so. So Luke chapter 11, and let's start tonight with verses 14 through 23. Luke 11, 14 through 23. And he was casting out a demon, and it was mute. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke, and the crowds were amazed. But some of them said, He cast out demons by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. Others, to test him, were demanding of him a sign from heaven. But he knew their thoughts and said to them, Any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a house divided against itself falls. If Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul. And if I by Beelzebul cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? So they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. 
When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house, his possessions are undisturbed. But when someone stronger than he attacks him and overpowers him, he takes away from him all his armor on which he has relied and distributes his plunder. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. First of all, it's interesting to me at least that we're in a section tonight with no parallel, and so the harmony of the Gospels really doesn't do us much good tonight, but I guess if we didn't have that, we wouldn't know this without a lot of research and a lot of looking back and forth in the accounts, but uh, this is basically just Luke tonight. There's nothing in the other accounts that, that is directly parallel to what we're looking at tonight. So nothing gets inserted here from anywhere else when we line all of this up in chronological order. It's all Luke for tonight. Uh, straight through. So continuing from last week then with the sample prayer, the parables, the discussion about a, a, the son asking for a fish and his dad not giving him a snake, if you remember that. We move right along now into verse 14. This is still the fall of AD 29. So the crucifixion is roughly nine months away at this point in the spring of 30. So with this as background, we have Jesus casting out a demon. And this particular demon made this man mute. But when Jesus cast it out, the man is able to speak. And obviously the people are amazed by this. This is something they hadn't seen before, perhaps. But, but there are some people who start accusing Jesus of casting out demons by the power of Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. Now again, it's probably not a parallel account, but something very similar happens, you may remember, back in Matthew chapter 12 and Mark 3. In the timeline, though, when we stretch this all out in chronological order, that healing seems to take place about a year earlier than this one. And there are some differences. Here he seems to be in Judea, while the other healing in Matthew and Mark happens up in Galilee. In Matthew's account, the man is unable to speak, and he is also blind. And here Luke doesn't tell us that this man is blind. And that, I think that would be very unusual for Luke as a doctor not to mention this, to mention less detail than Matthew and Mark instead of more. And the Harmony also points out that what happens immediately after these two healings is different. In the earlier healing, Jesus teaches in parables right away after it. But here, as we'll get to later on tonight, Jesus meets with a Pharisee. And so this is different from what we read in Matthew and Mark, even though some of the details might be very similar. But we need to remember that Jesus healed many people, probably thousands, if not tens of thousands of people over a three and a half year period. And obviously, he would heal a lot of people of the same thing that he healed other people of, if that makes sense. And uh, he would also face some of the same objections. And so it shouldn't surprise us then if this is not parallel, but very similar at the same time to what we find over in Matthew and Mark. Here the objection is that Jesus must be casting out demons by the power of the ruler of the demons. And obviously the ruler of the demons, the head demon, would seem to have this power. And so this is a, a quick and a very easy objection or a way to complain. Oh look, he's doing this by the power of the ruler of the demons. But what I want us to notice first is that the people do not deny that an actual miracle has taken place. And I find that interesting. That's not what we're talking about here. They don't say, oh, he didn't really do this. But rather, they admit that he did what he did. They're just explaining away the power that he used to do it. And so nobody denies that this man who was unable to speak can now speak, that this is not a part of this discussion. So this leads us to a second problem that these people had with this miracle. This was the wrong kind of miracle. And so they don't deny the man can speak, but they want a sign from heaven as opposed to a sign here on earth or something like that. So maybe they want fire from heaven that James and John wanted to call down on the Samaritans in our study a couple weeks ago. And so they basically, in the big picture here, they have two objections, not to the miracle itself, but as a way of whining about it, as a way of complaining about it. He does this by the power of the ruler of the demons, and then also we want a heavenly miracle. This is the wrong kind of miracle. That, that This is not what we were looking for. It's the wrong kind. My grandfather was a salesman for Wheeling Steel for many years, and I remember him telling me as I was growing up that as, as a salesman that he could never make a sale 
until somebody had an objection to his product or an objection to the sale itself. And what he meant by that was, if somebody kind of doesn't know, oh, I, I don't know. Or if somebody doesn't care about purchasing his product, or if somebody doesn't have the power to make a decision, he wouldn't be selling steel that day. But if he tried to make the sale, and if somebody had an objection to them purchasing steel that day, that was something that he could work with. Oh, you think our steel is too expensive? Well, we can work with that. You know, let me compare it, or let me see what I can do, that kind of thing. Or, oh, you aren't familiar with our product. If that's the objection, I don't know your steel. Well, we can work with that as well. Let me explain this. Let me show you this, and so on. And so... I would look at this passage, and it's pretty negative. They have two objections, but they have some objections. They're not just not caring about what happened here. So there is something good that we can say about this. Notice how the Lord answers. First of all, it is illogical, that first objection. If you think about it for just a second, you realize this makes no sense for the ruler of the demons to be kicking out his own demons. And the second part of the Lord's response is, if I'm doing this by the power of Beelzebul, by what power do your sons cast out demons? And we don't know what was going on with their sons, whether they were faking it, whether some of them were disciples of Jesus legitimately. But it's a solid response, isn't it? That's hard to argue with without condemning those in your own family. So, so he continues with the reminder that if he really did just cast out a demon by uh by the power of God, that the kingdom of God has come upon you. And so if you really understand what I've just done here, Jesus says, then this is a, a very serious thing that you really need to be paying attention to. Uh, by the way, most of those who knew the Old Testament, the religious leaders here, the scribes and the Pharisees and, and these men, probably would have recognized that phrase, the finger of God. I looked it up in my Bible today, and we've seen this before, way back in Exodus chapter 8, verse 19. You may remember after the plague of the gnats, I'd forgotten about this, but Pharaoh's magicians come to Pharaoh and they say, this is the finger of God. In other words, Pharaoh's own magicians come to Pharaoh and they say, Moses is not faking this. <laughs> This is not something that we can do. This is the real deal, Pharaoh, that this is the finger of God. And so I believe Jesus is trying to get these people to think, and he's probably addressing this to the people in the audience. When you hear finger of God, you think of Moses confronting Pharaoh. And obviously in this picture, Jesus is Moses, and the religious leaders represent the Egyptians, only the Egyptians at least recognize God's power, don't they? Which the Jewish rulers refused to do. And so Jesus is setting up this division in the people here. Notice Jesus then goes on to, to, to describe a strong man guarding his own house. And he's able to do that. It goes well. He protects his stuff until somebody stronger comes along. As I see it, Jesus is the stronger man in this picture. Satan seems to be ruling. Satan seems to be in control of world events until Jesus comes along. And so Jesus is coming to say that he is disrupting the plans that Satan has for the world. Then in verse 23, we have what almost seems to be the opposite of what Jesus said back in Luke 9.50. You may remember we studied this just a few weeks back. But back in Luke 9.50, the person the disciples ran into was actually another disciple that they just hadn't met yet. If you remember, they were concerned, this guy's doing miracles, and then Jesus answers that and basically explains, yes, he's really doing this, you just don't know him. But here, though, Jesus is describing somebody who is truly not with him, like Satan, like those who attribute Jesus' power to Satan. And so Jesus has now dealt with the first objection. He'll deal with the next issue, the people demanding a sign from heaven, in just a little bit. But First, we have kind of a little bit more about demon possession, almost a parenthetical statement where Jesus starts thinking and, and delivers this uh, message about demon possession in the next paragraph. So let's move on then to Luke chapter 11, verses 24 through 28. Luke 11, 24 through 28. When the unclean spirit goes out of a man, 
It passes through waterless places seeking rest, and not finding any, it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds it swept and put in order. Then it goes and takes along seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they go in and live there. And the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. While Jesus was saying these things, one of the women in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. But he said, on the contrary, blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. On the first half of this passage, Jesus seems to give us a behind-the-scenes lesson on how demon possession works. And to me, at First, at least, there doesn't really seem to be much of a practical reason for this. As we normally do, you know, we would ask the so what question. What does this really mean? And I don't know. I don't know why I need to know this. But it does show that Jesus understands how this works. When an unclean spirit leaves, it often tries to come back. And when it returns, it often makes it worse the second time. Jesus doesn't specifically apply it this way, but it seems to me that one possible application comes with the observation that if we remove sin from our lives and don't replace it with something better, something positive, something godly, we leave ourselves open to falling even worse into sin the next time. So when something leaves, if we get rid of pornography or alcohol or lying or any number of things, if, if we get rid of those things, we need to fill that void with something positive. Otherwise, we're asking for trouble. I think most of us learn in science class that nature abhors a vacuum. Nature hates a vacuum. Remember that lesson? And that seems to apply here. An empty space tends to get filled by something. And if I were to rotate the camera around in my garage, you could see that in a very practical way. Empty space gets filled very quickly. But again, Jesus doesn't apply what he's saying in this way, but I'm saying this seems to be true based on what the Lord says here. We might wish he had continued, and it's almost as if he meant to to explain this, to give the practical application for it, but at this point the Lord seems to be interrupted, doesn't he? One of the women in the crowd gives him a compliment, and actually it's a compliment to his mother. By doing this, by the way, the woman seems to fulfill Mary's prophecy that we studied a few months ago back in Luke 148. And that's where Mary, in Mary's song, her song of praise to God, she says, From now on, all generations will call me blessed. So it's interesting that that is exactly what this woman does. Mary's prophecy, we might say, back in Luke chapter 1, is starting to be fulfilled already. People indeed are already calling her a blessed woman because of everything that Jesus is doing and able to do. And that's what this woman does. Jesus responds, though, by pointing people back to the word of God. He does not point them to his mother, but he points them back to the word. I know people have a tendency to almost worship other people. People worship angels. People worship other human beings. And and even when it comes to somebody like Mary, as great of a person as she was, notice Jesus changes the focus here. He's saying, it's not about my mother. That's not who we're here to praise. All that really matters is hearing and observing the word of God. If he had wanted this woman to go on and on with her respect or almost worship of Mary, this would have been the perfect opportunity. But notice he does not. He redirects her toward the word of God instead. We now get back to the second objection. Remember, we dealt with the first one. He's casting out demons by the power of the ruler of the demons. So now we get back to the the second problem that they had. And the second problem was these people wanted a sign from heaven. And so they don't deny the miracles taking place, but they basically accuse him of performing the wrong miracle. That's not what we were looking for, Jesus. We want something else. So let's move on to Luke 11, verses 29 through 32. Luke 11, 29 through 32. As the crowds were increasing, he began to say, This generation is a wicked generation. It seeks for a sign, and yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah. For just as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. 
The queen of the south will rise up with the men of this generation at the judgment and condemn them, because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. It seems that word is perhaps getting around concerning this man who's healed. And so as the crowds are increasing, the crowds are growing, getting larger, Jesus gets back to those people who were demanding a sign. Remember, they saw a demon cast out. They saw a man suddenly able to speak who had not previously been able to speak. But this was not enough for them. They wanted something else. They wanted more. They had clear, unmistakable evidence of a genuine miracle, but these people wanted more. They wanted a sign from heaven. They wanted something even more spectacular. And so because of this, Jesus refers to them as a wicked generation. And in response to their demand for a sign, Jesus explains that the only sign that they'll get is the sign of Jonah. And then he explains this in more detail. He explains it earlier, a year earlier, if the harmony is correct, over in Matthew 12, 40, where he says, For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And so the sign of Jonah is the Lord's own death, burial, and resurrection. So if you are looking for something truly amazing, it doesn't get any more amazing than what will happen about nine months down the road. He then refers to the Queen of Sheba, the Queen of the South. She comes to hear the wisdom of Solomon, but he explains something greater than Solomon is here. Jesus is greater than Solomon. And then the Queen of the South and the people of Nineveh could only dream of what these people are seeing and hearing. And so they, therefore, will be held to a higher standard. The people who were there on this occasion will be held to a higher standard than the people of Nineveh and the Queen of Sheba. Okay, let's move on to Luke chapter 11, verses 33 through 36. Luke 11, 33 through 36. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it away in a cellar, nor under a basket, but on the lampstand, so that those who enter may see the light. The eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is clear, your whole body also is full of light. But when it is bad, your body also is full of darkness. Then watch out that the light in you is not darkness. If therefore your whole body is full of light, with no dark part in it, it will be wholly illumined, as when the lamp illumines you with its rays. Obviously, Jesus has already said something similar to this back in the Sermon on the Mount a few years earlier, back in Matthew 5. But it's a bit different here as the emphasis is on seeing clearly. And so to me, it seems that Jesus is addressing these people who are really not seeing clearly at this point. They are seeing the miracles, but they can't seem to see Jesus for who he really is because their eyes are not clear. Their eyes are not spiritually clear. They're not able to see what they're seeing in a spiritual light. The command here in verse 35, then watch out that the light in you is not darkness. That's the so what. That's what they actually have to do. They need to be careful. And so if he commands it, this must be something that we can control. Jesus doesn't tell us to do what we have no ability to do. So we need to be careful that we are not shining darkness to the world around us. We have control over the light that we shine. We choose to be full of light. It's not something that God does to us. He doesn't override us. He doesn't override our will, but we choose to do what the Lord is saying here. So watch out that the light in you is not darkness. Don't be shining darkness on people. Don't be a shadow in people's lives. Let's keep going over to Luke 11 verses 37 through 44. Luke 11, 37 through 44. Now when he had spoken, a Pharisee asked him to have lunch with him, and he went in and reclined at the table. When the Pharisee saw it, he was surprised that he had not first ceremonially washed before the meal. But the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but inside of you you are full of robbery and wickedness. You foolish ones, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? 
but give that which is within as charity, and then all things are clean for you. But woe to you, Pharisees, for you pay tithe of mint and rue and every kind of garden herb, and yet disregard justice and the love of God. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the chief seats in the synagogues and the respectful greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, for you are like concealed tombs, and the people who walk over them are unaware of it. So the religious leaders had been listening, and one of them, a Pharisee, invites Jesus into his home for a meal. And apparently the Greek word here refers to a meal that was eaten earlier in the day, so that's why the New American Standard has lunch instead of dinner. Uh, some translations may even refer to this as being breakfast. So it was an early meal, not the evening meal. And Jesus accepts the invitation. I think we learn from this that Jesus is pretty much just as comfortable among the wealthy and religious leaders as he is among the poor. Jesus talks to everybody. Jesus talks to anybody. And so he goes to this luncheon. But he doesn't play by their rules, does he? Because we find here that the Pharisee is surprised that Jesus doesn't ceremonially wash himself before eating. This is not a washing intended to remove germs. That wasn't a big thing back then. But this is a washing to be ceremonially clean before God. This is in no way required by the law of Moses. But instead, this is a man-made tradition that had apparently developed over the past several hundred years. So this is something the Pharisees had apparently added to their religious rule books. So they had the law of Moses, and then they had all this other stuff that they were supposed to do. And this was part of the other stuff. So this is something that they had added. The question I have is, could Jesus have washed himself here on his way into this meal? Could he have decided to follow their traditions by washing his hands as they were doing? Obviously, the answer is yes, he could have done that. Knowing their tradition, he could have kept it. But instead, though, Jesus seems to intentionally break their tradition for the purpose of making a point. He's not breaking the law of Moses. He's breaking their tradition. So when the Pharisee is surprised, what I find interesting is he doesn't seem to actually say anything, does he? He doesn't say, whoa, Jesus, what are you doing there not washing? He doesn't say it, but he said it with his eyes, perhaps. Jesus read his mind or read his face. And so Jesus responds to this man's surprise, and he makes a distinction between cleaning the inside of a cup or a platter as opposed to cleaning the outside of a cup or a platter. The Pharisees make a huge deal about cleaning the outside, but they ignore the inside. The inside is full of robbery and wickedness, but the outside looks perfectly clean. Of course, if I had to make a choice between using a cup that was dirty on the inside or dirty on the outside, I'd much rather the dirt be on the outside, wouldn't you? I'm drinking from the inside, so I want the inside. Obviously, I want the in and the outside clean, but if we had to make a choice, I think most of us would want the, uh, the cleanliness on the inside of the cup. So Jesus is not defending dirt on the outside. He's not saying it's okay to have a dirty cup. That's not the point. The point he's making is that it's what's on the inside that is truly the most important. Notice he says in verse 42, these are the things you should have done without neglecting the other. So he's not making them make a decision between cleaning the inside or the outside. You should be cleaning all of it. And he applies this very specifically to the Pharisees. They tithe, and they're really good at tithing. They make sure everybody knows they're tithing. But at the same time, they ignore justice and the love of God. Thinking back to what we studied last week, these people were being very just extremely careful to give God one out of every 10 mint leaves. They would go out in the garden and they'd see a plant with 10 leaves on it. They would pick one for God and they would take the rest. So they would do that kind of thing. But on their way to worship to deliver that one mint leaf, they would step over or cross over to the other side to avoid helping a man who had been beaten and left for dead. Remember the parable of the Good Samaritan? The priest and the Levite were on their way somewhere, maybe to worship, we're not told, and they ignore this man who is in desperate need of help. So once again, though, the, the solution is not to ignore giving. Jesus doesn't say, stop the tithing or whatever. 
but the solution is to do both. They need to give to God appropriately some of their mint leaves or whatever they were doing, but they also need to stop and help the guy who's been left for dead. I know some people condemn the Pharisees for being too particular about their obedience. And uh, from time to time today, somebody will say, oh, you're such a Pharisee. And I think what they usually mean by that is, uh, you are too concerned about following the law of God too perfectly. But if we look at this passage, that is not the objection that Jesus has here. Jesus never condemns them for this. In reality, Jesus condemns them for not obeying enough. They were ignoring parts of the law and then adding stuff to the law that really wasn't there. As Jesus says in Matthew 5.20, For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So let's just make sure that we don't use what Jesus says here to be any less concerned about God's law. Jesus was not dismissing God's law. He was not cutting on these men for, um, you know, obeying too much. That, that's really not a thing. I think it'd be hard to be too obedient to the law of God, especially when the law of God says, love God and love your neighbor. Those are the two greatest commandments. It's hard to outdo that. It's hard to do that too much. In the last few verses, Jesus condemns the Pharisees for loving the chief seats in the synagogues and the respectful greetings in the marketplaces. He goes into more detail over in Matthew 23 in another, uh, not a parallel, but another account where he addresses the same concerns. They were covering their evil hearts with this righteous outward disguise. He compares them to concealed tombs. There's a dead guy inside. But nobody knows. It looks all good on the outside. And the same thing goes for these men. They are dead inside. But on the outside, they look great. They look religious. It looks like somebody you would want to follow. And people will get defiled just by being near them because you're basically tombs that don't look like tombs. Of course, it was you'd be unclean under the law of Moses to touch a dead body or something associated with a dead body. And so Jesus is saying, you're making people unclean just by being near them. You need to have warning labels on you. Your outside needs to match the inside. I was thinking about Digger's Hotline. You know how you can't see stuff under the ground, and so you call the number and have them come out to your property, and they mark where everything is so you don't blow up something. And that seems to be what uh, what he's getting at here. Over in Matthew, Jesus refers to whitewashed tombs. My understanding is that the Pharisees would whitewash the tombs for the purpose of marking them to make sure they didn't accidentally defile themselves by stepping on a tomb accidentally. But these men, though, they are undercover tombs. They look good on the outside, but they are disgusting on the inside, and by being near them, it would make you unclean. Let's look at one last paragraph tonight in the few minutes we have left. This is Luke chapter 11, verses 45 through 54. Luke chapter 11, verses 45 through 54. One of the lawyers said to him in reply, Teacher, when you say this, you insult us too. But he said, Woe to you lawyers as well, for you weigh men down with burdens hard to bear, while you yourselves will not even touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets, and it was your fathers who killed them. So you are witnesses and approve the deeds of your fathers, because it was they who killed them, and you build their tombs. For this reason also the wisdom of God said, I will send to them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill, and some they will persecute, so that the blood of all the prophets, shed since the foundation of the world, may be charged against this generation. From the blood of Abel, to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the house of God, yes, I tell you, it shall be charged against this generation. Woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You yourselves did not enter, and you hindered those who were entering. When he left there, the scribes and the Pharisees began to be very hostile and to question him closely on many subjects, plotting against him to catch him in something he might say. At the beginning of this paragraph, one of the lawyers is upset. Jesus has 
insulted them as well. Wait a minute, this might be about us. You're offending us, you're insulting us. And instead of apologizing, instead of backing down, Jesus pretty much says, woe to you too. Yes, you're a part of this. So yes, while I'm at it, let's make sure we're clear here. And the issue he has with the lawyers is that they burden people down when they themselves do not even submit to those burdens they're placing on others. They make life religiously difficult for other people when they don't even follow their own rules. And then Jesus condemns not only the lawyers, but all of their ancestors as well. So they're offended, and, and he offends them right back, and even includes their parents and their great-great-great-grandpas in this. The lawyers pretend to mourn the prophets, but their fathers are the ones who killed the prophets. And of course, these are the same people who will go on to kill Jesus in just a few months. And so they are continuing the tradition of killing the messenger because they don't like the message. We need to be really careful as we study the Bible. Sometimes it's very tempting for us to say, well, if we were back there, if I was there, I would have been a follower of Jesus. I wouldn't have been like one of these men. And yet, is that the case? It sounds like something that these men might have said. So we just need to be very careful. In verse 49, it seems Jesus is quoting something. We don't have this quote anywhere in the Bible. And so it's possible Jesus is using some inside information here. This is something God has said privately. And Jesus, being deity, was in on that. Basically, God continued to send prophets knowing that some would be persecuted and even killed. But he loved his people so much, he wanted to get that message to them. In verse 51, we have a summary of all of those who have been killed for their righteousness, from A to Z, we might say, from Abel to Zechariah. Remember, Abel was killed by Cain. We studied this, just a few references in sermon form from Genesis 3, referring ahead to Genesis 4 a few weeks ago. Because Abel's sacrifice was acceptable to God, Cain's was not. In a sense, the first example of righteous or religious persecution, Cain was basically jealous that Abel was accepted, but his was not. Zechariah was the last to die, by some accounts, in the Old Testament, uh, in the way their Bible was arranged anyway, in 2 Chronicles 24, 20 through 22, if you want to read more about that, 2 Chronicles 24, 20. We just studied 2 Chronicles a few months ago in our Wednesday class. You might remember that 2 Chronicles was the last book of the Hebrew Bible. And so again, Jesus is summarizing all of the people ever murdered for being righteous, from A to Z, from the book of Genesis all the way to the very end of the Hebrew Bible, the book of 2 Chronicles. These people were on the wrong side of history. That is, the scribes, the lawyers in this passage. They were going the way of persecutors instead of going the way of the righteous. They were more like Cain than Abel. They were more like King Joash than Zechariah. In fact, they would be more likely to build a monument to Cain and to King Joash than they would be to build a monument to Abel or Zechariah. And Jesus says that these sins would be charged against this generation. And notice he says that twice in this short paragraph. In other words, they are continuing this behavior. Only now that Jesus is here, these men have no excuses. And their sins will be charged not to some future generation, but to this generation, the people alive here today. Many people see this as a reference to the coming destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans in 70 AD. All of these sins down through the years would finally catch up to the nation. The final woe on the lawyers is that they have taken away the key of knowledge from the people. So these men who should have been teaching the people were actually preventing the people from learning about God. Not only were they in, uh, not entering the way of knowledge themselves, but they were standing in the way of others as well. Jesus leaves the scribes and the Pharisees left behind come to this turning point. No longer are they neutral. No longer are they curious and asking questions. No longer are they exploring but now they are actively plotting and they are actively trying to find a way to get rid of Jesus in some way. Thank you for being with us tonight, either online or on the phone. Be sure to send me any prayer requests so I can get those in the bulletin as soon as possible. Let me know any changes or updates we need to, need to have. 
Uh, next week, come prepared by reading Luke chapter 12. You might uh, also want to look at this in the Harmony of the Gospels. Again, if you don't have that, let me know. I'd be glad to help out. But let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the one and only true God above all other gods. Tonight, we are thankful for your word and for the clarity that it brings to our lives. Thank you for sending Jesus, and thank you for the gospel accounts so that we can learn about you and your son for ourselves. We're especially thankful that we can read your word in our own language. What an amazing blessing that is. Thank you, Father. As we think about what we have learned from your son tonight through Luke, we pray that our hearts would be pure, that our spiritual sight would be clear, so that we can see you as we should. Thank you for the light of your word. As your people, we pray that we would not add to anybody's problems. We pray that we would not make anybody's life more difficult than it already is. We pray that we would not make anyone's burden any heavier than it already is, but we ask that we might be able to bear each other's burdens, leaning on our Christian family for support and offering support when we are able to do that. This week, we pray that we might find ways to serve and to help and to encourage. Be with Silas and Kenna on their way home from California. Be with Terry Brummel and the health concerns that she's facing right now. Uh, be with Abe, our good Christian friend and brother, and uh, we're thankful that doctors were able to find some areas of concern early and hopefully get those squared away and taken care of. We're thankful for that good medical care in his life. Right now, we also ask you to be with the elderly of the congregation, especially those who may feel cut off from the world right now, unable to get out and around and even do something as simple as shopping and fellowshipping with their Christian friends and family. Bless those who are caring for others and the burdens that they are carrying right now. Bless our teachers in the school system as they prepare for a new semester. Be with the healthcare workers as this pandemic just drags on and on. We pray for a quick end, but we pray in the meantime that we as your people might be able to help others as we should. We come to you with these requests in the name of Jesus, your Son, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.